back to Good Morning Sri Lanka. Now, if you missed the first segment of our show, I have with me here Professor Gregory Rose. He is attached to the Trinity Laban in the Conservatoire in London, and he is here with us for a very special event organized by the Symphony Orchestra of Sri Lanka and another vocal, for very qualified vocal performer who will be performing at that particular event is Asti Tenakun and he is with us in the studio as well. We were having a very lovely conversation with them about uh, what they expect from the show that's coming up on the 31st of May. It's at the BMICH and it is a gala opera night. So it's something new for all the music fans, especially the classical music fans, the opera fans in Sri Lanka. You can hear some in the background as well some of the pieces that you'll be hearing at the show but there's many more isn't there I've heard that you've got a bit experimental this time Gregory with uh, what the show will call for the audience well yeah, I mean we're doing a lot of really wonderful popular numbers such <laughs> as the one that's being played the anvil chorus from Il Trovatore by Verdi um, <clears throat> but whenever I do concerts I always put in just something that's a bit naughty, um, uh -huh. that, that is a bit a bit less known. And uh, so this time I put in a piece by the, the, the composer, the Russian composer, Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, who's probably not very well known mm. amongst your listeners. Um, but uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful composer. Um, he actually taught Stravinsky, the great Igor Stravinsky. And he was responsible with another couple of composers mm. for changing the whole of the, 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 the music in Russia at the time, um, in, this in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Um, <coughs> so why is it naughty that he's in there? <laughs> well, it's just, it's just that, that, that his, his music, that there's only one piece of his that's, that's known on the concert rounds, it's Scheherazade oh, okay. by Ribsen Korsakoff. Um, and people don't know his, his operas. His operas are not done very often mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the one we're doing, we're doing the introduction, it's like the overture to The Golden Cockerel, which is an absolutely wonderful opera. And uh, it starts with beautiful trumpets and things. And it's got lots of, it's got lots of sort of magical sounds in it, because every so often strange things happen in this opera. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, a, an old Russian folklore. Okay. And so every so often this, this cockerel just pops up and other characters pop up and in and out. And you hear this in the music. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's got these shades of real sort of um, drama and, and going to really dreamland quality. And then suddenly the the trumpet will come up again, the cockerel, ba -dum, bam, bam, <laughs> and that's the cockerel waking everybody up again, you know. So it, it's, it's okay, okay, so it's something different to look yeah. forward to. It was interesting it? listening actually at the rehearsal um, yesterday because I'd never heard the piece before and yeah, I was just yeah. sitting with the violins and, uh, you know, there are parts of it that sound, you know, typical romantic, classical romantic uh, writing and then all of a sudden you'd have these, <laughs> these weird things happening which, you know, it keeps, it keeps people on their toes but mm -hmm. also it's, it's interesting to listen to. Because Definitely. yeah, it's it's a transition period, I suppose, yeah. uh, historically. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was it was it was um, just it was just before Tchaikovsky. I mean, Tchaikovsky knew mm. Rimsky-Korsakov very well, um, and and he was definitely influenced by Rimsky, but even more so, Igor Stravinsky was influenced by uh, Rimsky because he was quite an experimental composer. He was in a way he was almost more experimental than than Tchaikovsky, even though Tchaikovsky came a bit later. But we're also doing some Tchaikovsky as well, of course. So, so, that's something else. <laughs> so for the opera fans, there, is, there are things they'll recognize, and then there'll be things they've yes. never heard before. Yes. So it'll be an evening uh, to really dis rediscover the music that they love. And if you <laughs> haven't discovered opera music yet, then this would be the perfect way to start, yeah. Yeah, wouldn't it? But Asta, now, when we speak about, you know, your voice is your instrument. Right. right, and it takes a lot of care. But it's not just something physical, you know, that you can, you know, carry in a case <laughs> right, exactly. to the practice session yeah. and come back again. So, what kind of uh, care do you have to take, and what kind of discipline do you have to instill in yourself when your voice is your instrument? Um, there's a lot that actually goes into it, which, especially, trying to travel here in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. if you're using public transport, it's very difficult because of all the smoke and the dust and yes. all that. So. Um, one of the things I've started doing recently is I wear a, you know those, uh, those okay. carbon-based masks that yes. you get? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I wear one of those when I'm just on the road, when mm -hmm. I'm walking, and it kind of looks weird. I get a few weird looks from people. And, <laughs> and also, this is really... Well, do, do I, they cross the road, I get on the other side of the pavement <laughs> in case it has infectious diseases. No, but I mean, I, even when I get on a bus or something mm -hmm. like that, I still yeah, have it on. And I also wear earplugs. Mm -hmm which because of all the sound and all of that but aside from that the basic things are getting enough rest and also eating the right food at the right times mm -hmm. 
So all because these things play an important role, I guess. It takes discipline yeah. to become an artist yeah. <laughs> if you want to go to the highest standards and the highest caliber. Mm. But mm. of course, when it comes to your orchestra, I mean, are you a hard taskmaster for them as well? And what is it like working well, with the Symphony Orchestra of <laughs> Sri Lanka? It's a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. Um, I, when you say am I a hard taskmaster, there's one thing that I surprise people with when I say that I gave up anger about 40 years ago. Um, <laughs> Because, That's a beautiful um, thing to say, actually. Well, it's, it's, it's just that conductors are traditionally um, thought of as being rather angry people. And indeed, <laughs> if you look back to the conductors of the, of the 1900s and 1910s, they were real taskmasters. And some of them were very, very unpleasant people, actually. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> Some of them still are. Some, some of them some still are. <laughs> you, you, do find, you do yeah. find some pretty unpleasant conductors around. Mm -hmm. But I, I actually decided to turn it on its, uh, turn it on its tail by... Instead of being angry, I, mean, I, I wasn't angry very often, but if I was angry, I found it didn't work. And I, I tried to analyse afterwards what had gone wrong. Because it, if you get angry, sometimes you do it almost as a, as a kind of uh, dramatic gesture. You know, why aren't you doing this? Da 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 da. Um, and I, if, I, if I was with professional musicians and I'd do that, I very often found that actually what would happen is that I'd make real enemies out of them. Mm -hmm. And that for the next two or three days of rehearsals, there's a really unpleasant atmosphere. And so I started thinking that actually this, this doesn't work. I'm, as I say, I've only lost my temper in rehearsals probably about a dozen times ever in professional rehearsals. But I can remember each time, and each mm -hmm. time it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. So I thought, right, what I'll do is I'll do it the other way around. Instead of, instead of getting angry, I'll actually get excited and say, now let's, let's make this better. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, that was bad, that was terrible, that was awful, I mean, just occasionally you say, if I'm working with students, which I do quite a lot, I might just say, that was terrible. But I might say it with a smile, <laughs> because they know it was terrible. Okay. And there's no point in emphasizing, you know, emphasizing that fact that it was terrible. Mm -hmm. So instead of, instead of saying that was terrible, that was bad, I say, let's, let's improve this, okay? Let's do a little bit, just do it a bit slower, try it again, break it down, try, try it with just a few instruments, maybe just the string instruments, and mm -hmm. let the woodwinds stop for a while. Do, deal with the tuning. Let's see if we can get the tuning better. So I say, let's get it better. So I try, I try and convert it from being bad things to being actually good things, making it better, and and hopefully exciting people, ho hopefully exciting the the performers to to, to to make them want to make it better. Mm. Wow. There's also probably the aspect of, yeah, you are leading them, but also yeah, you're making music with them. Yeah, and yeah. So there's mm -hmm. yeah. So it is. It is a concerted effort. You have yeah. to have everyone playing their parts. Literally, yeah. actually, to mm. <laughs> get everything working like a well-oiled machine. But you've travelled all over the world. I mean, both of you have got mm. experience abroad. And when you speak about, you know, what you've learned in other countries, the work ethic that you've seen in some other orchestras, what can be really applied here to Sri Lanka and what can we improve on when it comes to things we can learn from our neighbours and the orchestras around the world? Well, it's, it's, it's a slightly different scene here in that the orchestras I work with mostly are professional, so mm -hmm. they have to be there every day, every rehearsal, and they can only not be there when they're actually very ill or when you know, there's been an accident or some, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same with my students. When I'm working with my students in London, they have to be at the rehearsals. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a choice. Here, there is more of a choice it's a, it, in that it's a semi-pro orchestra, and so it's a slightly different scene in that quite often people can't be there because of family problems or maybe they've double booked or something like that or even things like they've, they've got to go to a wedding or a funeral. And so actually the, the, the attendance to rehearsals is inclined to be a bit fragmentary here. Mm -hmm. and. I would like that to improve. Improve. <laughs> All right. So words from the conductor straight to anyone who's performing on the 31st of May. <laughs> they should make a note of that. But really, experiences, uh, you know, in other countries always enrich what you already have, isn't it? And what what some of your favorite experiences are there? Oh, there have been a lot. But as far as work ethic and things like that are concerned, I think another thing that I've I've liked. Working with professional organizations is, uh, you know, being there on time mm -hmm. and on time. And this is something that I, I was guilty of not doing this when I was growing up here mm -hmm. uh, because I used to be late for several things and I didn't think much of it. But, you know, when you, when you go to a university to study a particular thing, mm -hmm. you know, rehearsal starts at 2.30, that means you need to be there at 2.25. 
the latest because you need to set up, you need to get ready. Mm -hmm. And I suppose for instrumentalists even more because they need to you know, take the instruments out, get everything. Mm -hmm. I carry my instrument with me basically. So, but um, it's easier for you. But I, yeah, in that sense, yes. But you know, because <clears throat> you know you walk in at two thirty one, rehearsals already started and things are mm -hmm. done. So that's one of the things that I've, I I love about um, about some organizations that I've worked with before. Again, a lot of things maybe that need to be stepped up, but uh, hey, maybe in the future you'll see a difference when you come back for your night around here Absolutely. in Sri Lanka, Gregory. But when it, going back to the gala opera night, mm. now what can you promise the viewers who will be coming on that day? I can promise that will them. Definitely happen. I can promise them they'll absolutely love about 90% of the music because okay. <laughs> it's just so gorgeous and mm -hmm. it's so fresh and some of it's very quiet and and uh, uh, peaceful that there's a humming chorus from Madame Butterfly which is gorgeous humming it's, it's chorus. A, yes they, they do this little bit of humming in the background and mm -hmm. and on stage what happens is that uh, Madame Butterfly is there waiting for her her lover to come back mm -hmm. who is a, a, a an American naval captain called Pinkerton and she's she's actually had a child by him and she's waiting for him to come back because mm -hmm. he's promised he'll come back when he does come back there's a disaster because actually he, he's married another person and then she commits suicide. I mean operas, you know, they, they always okay. either end happily or very unhappily mm -hmm. okay. and Madame Butterfly ends very One unhappily. One extreme or the other, is it? Ab absolutely. <laughs> it's like in life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. But, but uh, I, I mean I can promise the audience that they'll, they'll get a, an, a huge amount out of it uh, and, and hearing those singers and hearing us as well singing absolutely beautifully but uh, hearing the mass voices um, of you know some very good singers in, in both um, Colombo and from Candy, we've got a choir coming from Candy as well, mm -hmm. and it's just it's just a, a, a gorgeous. They'll they'll have a gorgeous time. All right, mm -hmm. and Asta, what about you? Uh, any butterflies that you have <laughs> regarding the performance as well? Um, I'm I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. And mm -hmm. uh, the pieces that I'll be singing, um, I've loved for a long time, mm -hmm. and it's a great opportunity for me to actually get to sing them in a in a concert setting. Um, there's, you know, m most of them, if not all of them, are sung by um, the romantic leads of, uh, the male romantic leads of the operas. So, um, uh, it's, it's beautiful music, and uh, it's, I've tried to vary it up a little bit, but most of it is uh, from the bel canto, which is 19th century, mm -hmm. um, which was, you know, the singer was the main... Uh, spectacle, I suppose, and was given okay. a lot of <coughs> license to do a few mm -hmm. things that he or she wanted to do. But um, yeah, I'm really, looking really looking forward to it. Yeah. I mean, because this is uh, something that l usually when you say the Symphony Orchestra Sri Lanka, the pieces they perform are just instrumentals. And this is an opera night where you'll have the vocals, you'll have a blend of the instrumentalists coming together. It's going to be a beautiful evening, I'm sure. And good luck to the both of you. Uh, for the 31st and for your future careers as well. Thank you so much for being with us on the show this morning. It thank was a pleasure you, having yeah, thanks you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you very much. And once again, a beautiful evening, a gala opera night organized by the Symphony Orchestra of Sri Lanka, brought to you on the 31st of May at the BMICH. So this is something that all music fans should not miss on and should definitely not miss out on. So do make some time from your schedules to check it out and make sure that you stay tuned to Good Morning Sri Lanka because we'll be right back with another great segment.